<laughs> it's not though. <laughs> Sorry, I should have tested that one before. Um, we'll try later. Kim, you want to kick us off? I should probably take myself off mute. So, hi everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to COE and our seminar or webinar rather, Rise Up Trio, the 2020 elections and you. We are thrilled to have an illustrious panel with us. We've called together folks from across the community, both ours and the nonpartisan electoral community at large. I have to put all my disclaimers out here. You know, COE is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. We don't endorse one party or another. And those of you who've been in the game for a while know that we work with folks on all sides of the aisle. And so um, we're not telling you how to vote, but we really want you to vote. We really want not just TRIO professionals, but TRIO students, their families, to really be engaged in the process. As our past board chair, uh, Christian Wiles, made an effort during his tenure as, as the board chair to really get civic engagement, to be a part of what we were doing in our work to educate students, to make sure that they were well-rounded. If we weren't doing civic engagement, we weren't really completing the job of educating our students. So this ties right in with this. And so we have a boatload of content Put on your seatbelts and get ready to go. Turn it back to you, Jonathan. Fantastic. Thanks, Kim. Um, so I'll just quickly go over the agenda. Um, thank you, Kim, for the excellent welcome. I'll introduce the panelists. The panel is going to be in two parts, one focusing on student voting, um, which is a, a bit of a new area for COE. So we turned this over to some outside experts in the nonpartisan voting space. Um, then we're going to talk about the Trio Votes Challenge. This is a new initiative that uh, COE is launching between now and the elections. So stay tuned. And we'll explain how it all works. We'll do some Q&A on the first part. Then we'll move into our second part of the panel, focusing on how you can host your own town hall or a virtual congressional meeting. Um, and then we will uh, talk about our call to action and share some resources on this. We'll have Q&A then on the second half of this. Okay, so that's the run of show. Um, in terms of context, Kim already did this out very well, but this is part of our 2020 year of student civic engagement. Um, and we had a student steering committee of TRIO students around the country who helped kind of guide this effort. And, um, and here we are. So this is the next event in this series. And we are really excited to uh, welcome our panelists. Let me go ahead and introduce them. So we have Clarissa Unger. She is the director of the Students Learn, Students Vote Coalition. It's a nonpartisan student voter registration group, um, also focusing on Get Out the Vote. Uh, it's, a, it's a project of the National Conference on Citizenship, and it's the largest nonpartisan network in the US dedicated to increasing college student voter participation. Uh, Clarissa has a background in advocacy, communications, fundraising, political campaigns. Um, and before she founded this coalition, she served as the development coordinator for the Dole Institute of Politics at the University of Kansas. Um, and she has an MPA from University of Kansas and a master's in comparative politics from Trinity College in Dublin. Next, we'll be hearing from Gabrielle Slaughter, who is a program manager at Andrew Goodman Foundation another nonpartisan student voter registration and get out the vote organization. Uh, Gabrielle recently graduated from Spelman College in Georgia with a bachelor's in poli-sci. Her passions include dancing, social justice, public interest, um, and she takes pride in being a servant leader and mentor for young black and brown girls in her community. Uh, so stay tuned and um, it'll be fantastic to hear from Gabrielle. Next, we've got James Prince Jr., who is the president of the South Carolina Trio Association. Uh, he will discuss organizing a nonpartisan forum with candidates or elected officials. Uh, James uh, has a BA in African American Studies and a BA in Media Arts, both from the University of South Carolina. He has an MFA in Creative Writing from Full Sail. Uh, university. One of the greatest gifts ever bestowed upon him, as he says, is acceptance into Upward Bound. And from there, he has been a coordinator, a participant, a tutor, a residence counselor, an instructor, and now the state president of the South Carolina chapter of TRIO programs. Okay, so thank you, James. We look forward to hearing from the best. And next we have a trio from Cornell, a trio of trio uh, folks from Cornell. All right, and so we will, we will have um, some, some folks talk about their experience in Cornell uh, with all, all parts working together. So we've got Kristen Adams, who is the director of the Office of Federal Relations. 
Um, and I actually, incidentally, I worked with her when she was at the U.S. Department of Education uh, in the Legislative Affairs Office, and I was on Capitol Hill. I would call her and say, what is this higher ed bill? What is this? I hear there's some trio uh, grants coming out. What am I supposed to do with this? And she would pick up the phone and answer the questions. So she is, uh, she is a real pro on, on uh, federal relations, and um, she uh, attended uh, Virginia Tech for her B uh, BS in marketing and also got a law degree at Widener School of Law. Um, we've also got on our Cornell panel, Simon Velasquez, who is a graduate of Boise State University where he earned a BA in poli sci. He earned an MA at Cornell and is a PhD candidate currently in the Department of Government. He is currently a uh, McNair program advisor. And we will, last but of course not least, we'll hear from Ariane Allman, who is a Cornell McNair Scholar in the class of 2021. What a senior year, right? You never thought that your senior year would look like this. Um, but, uh, but it's been, a, been one to remember and you've really made the best of it. So we look forward to hearing about your experience um, with Advocacy for TRIO at the national level. So thank you all so much panelists and uh, let's jump right in. I think uh, we'll get started here with Clarissa. Thanks, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I'm gonna assume yes. Okay, great. <laughs> awesome. Well, I am so thrilled to be here with all of you today. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, my name is Clarissa Unger. I'm the director of the Students Learn, Students Vote Coalition. We all talk a little bit about us. You can go to the next slide. Um, we are a nonpartisan uh, coalition that was founded in early February of 2016. We uh, really work to provide year round resources for campus nonprofit community student leaders that are working to build a more representative democracy by working to increase the college student voting rates across the country. Um, we have over 400 nonpartisan organizations that participate in the coalition in a reach of almost 2000 campuses across the country that we work with through those coalition partners. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, I did want to um, also highlight that we are a project of the National Conference on Citizenship, uh, which is a congressionally chartered nonprofit that was started by Presidents Truman and Eisenhower back in the 1940s. Um, there are only about 90 other congressionally chartered nonprofits in the country. Some of the other ones that you might be familiar with include the Boy Scouts of America or the American Red Cross. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so I'll talk a lot about uh, voter engagement today, but I wanted to start just with voter registration. And I know that a lot of the folks on this call don't necessarily work with college students. So at the outset, I wanted to mention that anything that I'm going to talk about is does not have to be necessarily just directed towards folks that are working with college students. In many different states, uh, young people as, as young as 16 years old can go ahead and pre-register to vote. So I've included on this slide here a list of the 14 states plus DC that permit pre-registration starting at 16 years old, which is reflected on the map um, that's on the right side of the screen. There are other states as well that offer pre-registration starting at 17 or 17 and a half, um, but the best source to go to if you have any questions about when uh, young people can begin to register or to pre-register in your state is to go to the National Conference on State Legislatures. You can go to the next slide now. Um, so I mentioned we started the coalition in um, early 2016 and we have been working with hundreds of campuses across the country on how to best engage their students in the voting process since then. Um, and what we've really found is that the key to engaging students across the board is to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with every single student through some sort of systematized process. So we know that all of you have different processes set up that you talk with and um, provide communication to all of your students through. Um, one thing that we suggest and we work with um, the campuses that are in a number of our programs to do is to insert into those processes a conversation that lasts for about three to five minutes um, to help 
register students to vote, walk them through the voting process, and help them to become confident about participating in our democracy. Because we know that one thing that holds young people back from participating is really just because they're new to the process and they might be confused um, or have some misconceptions about what it takes or what it, um, the length of time it might take um, to actually register and participate. So those one-on-one -on -one conversations we found are really, really important in terms of getting every student that you work with, every student on your campus to register and actually participate in the process. We go to the next slide. So the good news is that many of these, com these conversations can still happen in a digital space if you are not interacting on a daily basis now in person with the students and young people that you work with. Um, so we offer a number of, of uh, different conversation guides, um, different trainings that folks can do to still provide one-on-one -on -one support for students. And you can still integrate this into systematized processes that you may already have. We can go to the next slide. And also the next one. But as I mentioned, when we talk about voter engagement, we really can't just focus on voter registration and call it a day. Um, some of you might be aware that there is a provision in the Higher Education Act that does require colleges and universities, at least, to provide voter registration for their students. So one thing that we noticed when we got into this work, that there were a number of folks on campuses that were providing voter registration, but then sort of stopping there. Uh, but we know that that's not enough. There's a lot more that we have to do to make sure that students and young people have the information that they need to actually participate. You can go to the next slide. So at the Students Learn Students Vote Coalition, we really think about a vote ready cycle when we're talking about voter engagement. So it doesn't just start and stop with voter registration. We have to also provide voter education, help to mobilize young people to actually get out there and vote, and then really institutionalize this work and build it into our systems and processes for the long term so that we can best figure out what works for our campuses and our communities, and then build and iterate on that from year to year. You can go to the next slide. So how might you get started in doing some of this? Um, we have a number of different, what we call vote ready uh, mobilizations or opportunities that are aligned with the calendar throughout the next eight weeks really, um, that you can very easily plug into. You can go to the next slide. So one that you might already be familiar with is National Voter Registration Day. This is a national holiday to help encourage uh, people to register to vote or to check and make sure that their registrations are up to date. That takes place every year in September. This year it will take place on September 22nd. Um, through the SLSV Coalition, we run a program along with the Alliance for Youth Organizing called the Campus Takeover. So we provide specific tools, resources, and funding to campuses that want to have some kind of event or celebration on National Voter Registration Day. As I mentioned, um, we in the past had seen that a lot of folks celebrated National Voter Registration Day and then sort of called it a day. Um, so this year we teamed up with a number of other national nonprofits and businesses to launch what we're calling National Voter Education Week. This very strategically will fall a couple of weeks after National Voter Registration Day um, and will hit throughout that week on different themes like making sure that your voter registration went through, making sure that you know how to uh, request a mail-in ballot, how to find out what's on your ballot, um, that you have a plan to vote and also have a plan to pivot if need be because we all know that 2020 has thrown a lot of curveballs at us this year. Um, and we'll also be providing information on how to make sure that others in your community are also vote ready as well. Um, so again, that's a digital week of action that anyone can plug into. You can go to votereducationweek.org to learn more about that. And then finally, to round out those vote ready mobilizations, and again, these are not things that are specific to colleges and universities. Any organization, any entity can participate in these and we encourage that. Um, is the third is vote early day, which is really focused on making sure that people know what their options are, celebrate the act of voting and vote early if that is something that is available to them, which is a possibility for, I believe, 80 or 90% of the country at this point. Um, but vote early day will take place 
on October 24th. Um, so we really encourage you to check out these different mobilizations and get involved um, as a way to help make sure that the, the young people that you work with are vote ready this fall. You can go to the next slide. In addition to this, another um, <laughs> uh, need that you may have heard of is uh, poll workers this year. So while there's a lot of talk and a lot of more folks are going to have the opportunity to vote by mail, we know that that is not something that is totally accessible for everyone. So there are still going to need to be in-person in -person polling locations, and we really need poll workers this year. So this is another effort that we have really been focusing on through the SLSB Coalition. You can go to the next slide. Great. Um, so one of the uh, one of the many reasons um, that we are encouraging young people to consider to be poll workers this year is quite obvious. Um, a lot of the older folks who typically are serv service poll workers um, are at a much higher risk for COVID nineteen. So young people have a real opportunity to step in here and be real uh, heroes of our democracy this year. Also in many states, they can get paid to do this. Um, also in many states, um, they do not need to be 18 years old in older, order to be a poll worker. So in many states, folks that are 16 can, and 17 can also serve as poll workers. Um, we also know this is a huge um, issue for access. So if there are not enough poll workers, um, polling places are going to be shut down and then there will be lower turnout as well. Um, additionally, poll workers have the opportunity to make everyone's voting experience a really positive and empowering one, which is something that can really help to ensure that people continue to vote in the future as well, especially if that's your first experience with the voting process. And also, um, you can continue ensure that your community's election and results are smooth and efficient. Um, and one thing I do want to note also on this as well is that you, I, I don't want this to be confused with poll monitoring, which many of you may have heard of as well. That is a more of a partisan um, ask that some campaigns and uh, parties ask. Being a poll worker or an election worker or an election judge means that you're serving in a nonpartisan role with working with directly your local election officials to make sure that elections in your community go smoothly. You can go to the next slide. Great. Um, and so how to become a poll worker. Um, we are partnering with a national campaign called Power the Polls, um, which is looking to recruit over 500,000 poll workers this year. Um, you can go to powerthepolls.org slash SLSB, sign up there, and then you'll get followed up with, with additional information about how to connect with uh, specific election officials in your jurisdiction, then follow up and do a training, and then show up and power the polls on election day. Pretty simple. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Great. And then just wanted to hear, leave you with a number of the resources that we've shared. Um, again, I'll just mention our website is slsvcoalition.org. We've got links to a lot of great resources and tools there as well. And that's it for me. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you, Clarissa. Um, we had one question, but I want to save it to the end because there may be more questions about all of the voting uh, pieces, and we've got a ton of information to cover. So just uh, um, Jenny, I saw your question. Thanks for typing it in. And we will ask that to Clarissa at the end of this uh, section on voting. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, Gabrielle, uh, let's hear about the Andrew Goodman Foundation, the work you're doing. Take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, again, I'm Gabrielle Slaughter, and I'm super excited to be with you all here today to share information about the Andrew Goodman Foundation and the strategies we use for voter engagement, especially like heading into November. So you can go to the next slide, yes. Um, I'm going to start with telling you a little bit about the Andrew Goodman Foundation. Um, so basically, our mission is to make young voices and votes a powerful force in democracy by training the next generation of leaders, engaging young voters, and challenging restrictive voter suppression laws. The organization is named after Andrew Goodman, a Freedom Summer volunteer and champion of equality and voting rights 
who was murdered by the Ku Klux Klan in 1964 at 20 years old. Along with James Cheney and Michael Swarner while registering Black Americans to vote in um, Mississippi. Oh, and I forgot to mention that any of the links that um, you see on the PowerPoint, um, Nicole will be dropping them in the chat so that you all can have access to everything. Um, so Vote Everywhere is our main program. Um, it's a program that partners with different American colleges and it engages students through programming focused on voter registration. And we also offer a lot of um, leadership development, voter education, get out the vote, and youth voting advocacy to increasing student voting. Our, pro our program includes an alumni association that allows um, former ambassadors to stay connected even after they've moved on from their undergraduate experience. And um, we have many projects that they can convene regularly. We also have the Puffin Democracy Fellows and our National Civic Leadership Training Summit every year, which is very good for all of our ambassadors and very interactive. This year we were able to open it up because of COVID. And you just learned a lot like in um, regards to leadership development and it's a, a good way to get pumped about just voting and civic engagement in general. We can move on to the next slide. Okay, so um, this is a breakdown of our Andrew Goodman campus teams. So we, we provide funding, we offer a, a paid ambassador program, and we send activity grants to each campus team in order for them to implement the things they want to do on campus that year. Um, we offer support with digital tools like simple texting, and we have um, My Vote Everywhere, which is basically a personalized website for each campus. So these campuses can put whatever information they want on there. So if their campus has a polling location, it can be found there. We also have different links and things of that nature. Um, advising, we advise the program managers, which is what I am, um, that's my role at AGF. We help to advise each of the campus teams with things they can do on campus. And if they need any of our assistance, like besides the financial support, we offer that too. We offer like just different outlooks on how they can really mobilize their campus. And training, like I said, through the NCLTS summit that we have every year, and we have different webina webinars during the semester. Um, we have recordings on our YouTube channel of all of this, if anyone wants to go see, because we have some pretty great videos on there. We had some really interesting speakers at our last summit. So if you want to go see, it's there. Nonpartisanship, we don't endorse candidates or political parties. We're just strictly about civic engagement and getting out the vote. Um, TRIO staff can partner by, if a campus is already where we're present, we can connect with you with the campus champion and students can openly apply for the ambassador positions to volunteer. If not already on a campus, you can fill out an interest form, which Nicole will drop in the group message. Okay, we can move on to the next slide. Um, here are more resources. Um, this is the um, My Vote Everywhere website. It's just an example of what each campus's website looks like. So this little screenshot in the right corner, each campus has their own website like that with their own individual tabs. Most of them share most of the same information, but if there's anything that the, the campus would like to customize, we do that and we're willing to like, change the pictures and everything. Um, and campus vote projects, student state gu guidelines is kind of how, what we use to um, navigate through the different state laws on different campuses because that can be an issue at time when doing this type of work. So we um, encourage, oh, we can go to the next slide, I apologize. Yes, this is the voter registration best practices. So before COVID-19, we did a lot of like voter registration drives and tabling and presenting at meetings, stepping into classrooms, attending city council meetings, attending board of election meetings so we can understand what exactly is going on. But with COVID-19, we understand that a lot of campuses have different rules now that weren't present before. So um, we encourage like social distancing, outdoor tabling or virtual events, social media campaigns. Social media will be everyone's best friend throughout up until November. Um, it's the quickest way to reach a lot of people. Um, we also promote virtual voter turnout information tools through My Vote Everywhere. We have a, um, a pledge to vote on there. 
And that's how kind of how we keep people in our network and keep them motivated and reminding them of the pledge they made. And virtual advocacy for more accessible voter registration um, practices. And for my vote everywhere, it's very user friendly. We have buttons to register to vote, request ballots, absentee ballots, sign up to be a poll worker. We are also partnered with Power the Polls. So yeah, all of that is extremely important. Uh, you can go to the next one. Yes. Um, this is just um, a deeper dive about the virtual advocacy that we're pushing for this um, next semester. We have, like I said, the pledge, civil dialogues, social media campaigns, sample ballot resources can all be found on our My Vote Everywhere pages for each campuses. And we keep track of like the information for each state, to make sure it's updated with correct information and that our students won't have to really worry about that. They just kind of worry about how they're going to get their campus mobilized. Um, we can go to the next one. And this is the pledge to vote um, that you can be found on our website. Nicole will drop that link also. Um, this is the, the work we typically encourage our campus teams to do on campus. Um, the canvassing, which is the dorm storms, going from dorm to dorm, phone banking, parties at the polls, offering rides to the polls. That's something that we've seen to be very beneficial. And like in light of COVID, some students have even been buying stamps and envelopes to like give out to the students on campus so that it can be easier. They don't have to worry about that because our generation, we aren't really familiar with using stamps like that. So it's definitely anything to make the students, make it easier for the students to vote is helpful. We can go to the next one. Okay, there we go, we're finished. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions, you can drop them in the group message. We encourage you to go on and make the pledge to vote so we, you can have this, so we can have you in our network and keep in contact and keep you updated on the things we're going on. And hopefully you guys can be a part of AGF in the future and maybe attend NCLTS or anything of that nature we'd love to have you a part of. Thank you all. And I'm so happy we were able to do this. Thank you. Oh, great to hear from you and about uh, all the things that Andrew Goodman Foundation are doing on campuses around the country. So I'm sure there are going to be a lot of excellent questions. Um, I have a couple right now. But first, drum roll, please. <laughs> Introducing, hold on, the trio votes challenge. All right, so, um, so we, for the first time in history, are encouraging all of our programs in the country and all states to have a competition. Uh, the prize is bragging rights, and, uh, and the goal is to try to get the largest percentage of your TRIO students uh, who are eligible to vote registered and actually confirm voting in the election. Again, we are nonpartisan. You can't tell anyone who to vote for, who not to vote for, um, but we're gonna try to see if we can have a little friendly competition. And so here is how it's gonna work. Um, we'll have a competition at the program level and the state level. And in addition, there will be extra points for congressional advocacy events and hosting, let's say a, tele a virtual town hall or a, a candidate forum where you invite both candidates in a bipartisan way. And the second part, the second part of our panel will go into detail on those types of events. Um, but the basic gist of it is for the voting piece of this, um, like Clarissa mentioned, uh, we are encouraging our TRIO staff to develop a systematic plan to ask every student individually for three to five minutes to walk them through the voting checklist, right? So this is not just put out a tweet and say, hey, everyone go vote and like checked off, you're done. No, well, you need to build in that three minute conversation with each student using vote.org. We'll walk through some tools here and we're gonna be sharing all these resources, uh, hopefully by tomorrow. Uh, but basically it has to be systematic and attached to what you're already doing, right? So if you have a Zoom uh, scheduled check-in with your students every week, every two weeks, add three minutes to walk them through this voting checklist and have them pull up vote.org on the phone and literally type in their information and make sure they're registered to vote on the spot. Um, and in fact, I just tested this out. So I, I did a quick sample of this with Ariane, who's, our, who's gonna be on our next panel. Um, and Ariane, how long did it take to register to vote? We, we had a little call and we dealt with this right away, right? 
Yeah, it took me about maybe like five minutes in total to do okay. everything. Yeah. And you, so you checked and you were already registered back home in Newport, yes. New Virginia, right? And you're, even right. though you're a student at Cornell. And so you, what you had to do then was go and, and make sure that your mail-in ballot was, was um, up to speed and was going to make it to Ithaca in time. Yes. Right? So you went in and you clicked Correct. on the thing and then vote.org sent you to the Virginia website and you confirmed that you are registered to vote in Virginia and you have your mail-in ballot coming to you in Ithaca, New York in time to vote. Correct. All right. So that was five minutes. Okay, check. All right, so Cornell, you got a head start, and now you have a few, about a couple hundred more to go, and then you can win this thing, all right? So, so that's the basic gist of it, okay? But don't do this on your own. So if, you're, if your campus already has an existing organization like the Andrew Goodman Foundation, or let's say your administrators have signed on to the All In Campus Democracy Challenge, where they as a campus are trying to get a certain percentage of the students voting uh, throughout the campus, right? Or if your uh, your your school already is a member, or you have organizations part of the Students Learn Students Vote Coalition, well, don't recreate the wheel. Coordinate with them and have and you know have, find a way to reach all of your trio students using existing partnerships. We also are going to strongly encourage whoopsie that you sign up for each of these individual voting holidays um, that Clarissa mentioned. A quick note: um, we're sure everyone on the on this call is already. Uh, registered and paid for COE's annual conference. It's our biggest year, uh, event of the year. 1,700 people uh, with professional development on, on how to be the best possible trio, trio staff you can be. So by all means, do not do anything on National Voter Registration Day that conflicts with our conference schedule. But if it's before or it's the two days after, um, you know, there are tons of resources, social media tools, organizing guides on that, um, on that resource that you can use to uh, get your students registered to vote in time. Okay, and same with each of these other events that Clarissa mentioned. Okay, and so also as Clarissa showed, you know, if you serve students under 18, if you're upward bound or uh, talent search, then you can register them, uh, pre-register in many states. And if not, encourage the students to talk to their parents, their older brother, older sister, their friends, right? And register other people who are eligible to vote in this election. Um, I'll show you uh, what one of the tools we'll be sending out, but we're gonna have a tracking system so you can internally keep track of all of the TRIO students on your roster and just come up with the summary numbers, right? So I stole this resource from something Clarissa and her colleague just sent me today, um, and I'll show you what this looks like. But an important note, do not send us any student names for privacy purposes. I don't wanna know a single student name, their birthday, their voting status, any of that. All we want to uh, report for this challenge is the summary numbers. How many students have you talked to? How many students? Have you confirmed individually, they, they've gone through vote.org and confirmed that they are in fact registered to vote. They have actually voted for sure confirmed, right? That is what we're trying to get, just numbers. I don't want any private student information reported up um, or reported out, okay? So that is that and we'll, we'll have tools for uh, tracking internally as well as sharing through a Google form, okay? So stay tuned for those. All right, and then students, so uh, basically, you go through each step, right? You, you register, um, you request a vote by mail if that is appropriate for your situation in your state. Um, and you know, in a normal year when you're voting in person, it's fun to take a ballot selfie, right? And to, to take a picture of yourself you know, in line at the voting place on election day you know, with five of your friends, big hug, we're at the polling place, vote here sign. Unfortunately, with COVID, you know, there's going to be a lot more voting in person. So this may not be so glamorous, but I've seen a lot of really good selfies of picking up your ballot and putting it in the nearest giant blue mailbox. Okay, so that that's a good selfie. It looks good. You get lots of you get lots of um, retweets and shares. Okay, so don't be ashamed to put that ballot in um, each step of the process. Uh, make a selfie of that and hashtag trio votes. All right. So commit to going through the process with three specific friends or family members, right? So when you're in those conversations with TRIO staff, think in your head, okay, let's see, do I have an older brother who may or may not be registered? Okay, how about two of my friends that may not be in TRIO, but you know, they're first gen low income, like let me just check on them. Come up with three specific people and triple your impact. Have them go through the same process, okay? And then TRIO state presidents, James, I'm looking at you on the screen. 
Okay, we are going to show you the back end of this. So as programs report, okay, uh, we have 117 SSS students and so far we've talked to 53 of them and of those 53 27 of them have registered to vote so far well James you're gonna see all that and you're gonna say okay well so I see a lot of I see a lot of colleges in South Carolina have joined but there's also a few have, who have not started yet right so then James we can encourage you to talk to the other uh, trio programs in South Carolina and help them get on the board so that you guys have a chance of winning because right now Ithaca is winning one to zero <laughs> so, so good luck <laughs> But I think you can take them. So so they, go. got us, they got us beat by one, but we, we can they do got, a comeback. Yeah, it's not over. You know? It just started. It just started. It just started. So don't worry. Yeah. Um, and so basically, we're going to, Terrence, our uh, communications uh, vice president, has put together a beautiful graphic that looks nothing like this. But I scrapped this together. And basically, for each of the um, holidays, we're encouraging these to be sort of like internal deadlines. Right. I mean, these, these may not, these may not correspond perfectly with your state's internal deadlines, but if you do each of these steps by these student voting holidays, you will beat the state deadlines. Okay, so that's what these recommended deadlines are there. I see a little trash talk on the chat here. Okay, I see you. I see you. Um, and so we are going to encourage, you know, that you walk these students through each of these steps on the checklist, right? Check, are you registered to vote? So yes, Ariane, she plugged her address in there. She is confirmed registered to vote in Virginia. Okay. Um, you know, registered to vote, check. She already did. She's confirmed. She would tell the trio staff yes, and they'd mark it down on their tracking sheet. Okay, and then, um, but what she did not have was a, a mail-in ballot yet to, um, for Ithaca, you know, in New York up in this cycle. So she filled out that uh, with the Virginia website. We're confirmed and that's going in. All right, that, that, that will be the, the ballot will then come to her in New York. Then she has to fill the thing out and, you know, find a stamp somewhere and mail it. Right, so that's a whole other process. And we're gonna encourage TRIO staff to follow through um, with that stage of the process as well. Okay, and then October 5th through 9th is National Voter Education Week. Again, resources, uh, toolkits. Uh, we encourage you to join and sign up for this, um, this national voting holiday. This is a chance to kind of pledge and make a plan, right? So we walked through most of that, um, Ariane and I, and it was, you know, we, it's gonna be, she's gonna vote by mail, but when, right? But, but how, right? We've got, you know, we've got midterms coming up, right? There's a lot of other things happening. You know, you know Ariane, like, should, should you wait until November 2nd to put that thing in the mail? The, the election, the final the election, November third. You gonna put it in the mail November second? Yeah, no, I definitely should put it in the mail. That. That's right. Good answer. <laughs> good answer. Right. So you know, at least a week before would be good. You know, who knows what's happening with um, with the postal service? It, there's been some delays with COVID and all kinds of things. So if you put that mail-in ballot in the mailbox by October 24th, it should get there in time. And that is why vote early day is scheduled that day. For many people, you know, maybe it's best, maybe it's not possible to vote early by mail or you miss the deadline to request the vote by mail and then get the actual mail ballot and then mail it back to the um, county election um, uh, folks. So for, for those people, maybe best to actually show up at one of the early, early voting centers, right? Look those things up and go find the closest one. And that really helps spread out the line. So you're not waiting in a line on election day, but you can vote a week early, two weeks early, three weeks early. Uh, in person if you want to do it that way. Okay, and then November 3rd is election day. All right, so that's the basic gist of it. We'll have resources and tools and links for all these things and TRIO staff can work with their students on it. All right, so here is what you'll see tomorrow um, and you'll be able to dig into it, but it's basically, here's a sample. Um, the green is the information that you will be reporting in the Google Sheet. Right, so the top part, I stole and modified this from what you sent me this morning, you and Maggie sent me this morning, Clarissa. Basically, your institution, your state, your program, the staff name, who's the coordinator for this, it does not have to be the program director. It does not have to be the state president. We would encourage you just to find someone within the program or the state and delegate this project to. Um, and then that person is gonna delegate which staff members are suggested to talk to each student. It could be suggested to be on the regular schedule you already have of who is the uh, regularly scheduling to, um, to meet with each student, not stealing. Beg, borrow, and steal, okay? And then, so you, you probably have this already, student birthday. You can kind of decide, you know, and this goes to a question I'm about to answer. Many of the students may not be 18 in time to vote in this current election, and if so, that's fine. 
Um, but we want to just get a number of how many are eligible. Um, so we know that's kind of like our denominator. When we're calculating this thing as a percentage, right? You know, um, we want to know not just the number of students, but how, what percentage of your eligible students you are registering to vote on time and are getting to vote. So with that, it's helpful to have this guesstimate. Um, if you don't have birthdays or are otherwise not able to come up with this, then you can put in your total eligible as just the total number of students you have. Um, let's talk about pre-college for a minute because um, many people are asking that question. So you, so basically this, this um, the, the percentages of your eligible students, right? So, so if you're upward bound and you only have like 20 students who happen to be uh, 18 by then, then really you're just trying to get all those 20. More students will get you bonus, right? So the, as, as Angela asks us here, if you get the parents to sign up and confirm that they are in fact voted or confirm that they are in fact registered, you can get bonus points for the parents, right? For your upward bound students, for their older siblings, right? You can get bonus points for them also registering and voting. Okay, so excellent question, um, extra credit. But again, this is out of a percentage, a percentage of eligible uh, students who will be 18 or older um, you know, by election day, that's what we're going for. So mostly it's gonna be college and um, EOC and Veterans Upward Bound programs that are gonna have the big numbers of students that are their kind of um, target that they're going uh, to make sure they have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with. All right, and then same thing for each step in the checklist, you know, are they registered? What state? Will they, met, will they mail uh, their ballot in or are they planning to go in person early vote? Um, and what's the status of their mail ballot, right? Did they request it? So Ariane would, this, this is where we would be with Ariane. She's already requested her mail-in ballot and she is in fact registered. So she, she is where we are now. And then voted, no one's voted yet, right? North Carolina, I think, just got ballots in the mail this week. So only North Carolina is gonna start being early birds on this and then a lot of other states are gonna catch up in the final eight weeks. All right, so that's the gist of it. Keep this internal, I don't wanna see this. No one wants to see this at COE. No state president wants to see this. No one wants to see any student names or details. The only thing we want are these summary numbers that are gonna, sum, that are gonna basically add up the totals from all these students. And then you'll use those to report into the re, um, reporting sheet, right? That's a Google sheet that you send and COE sees it. Um, the state presidents and others are going to see the back end. So, so James, you'll be able to see what spits out of this reporting. You'll be able to see, you know, uh, each of the schools in South Carolina that have submitted and the ones that haven't. And then you can email and, and talk to them and say, hey, let's, let's get on board. Okay, so that's the, basic, um, that's the basic gist of how this challenge works. All right, so great. All right. Um, so the scoring system, if you really want to get into details, so, and we'll put that, we have a whole resource guide we're going to send out with this, but basically up to 100 points, um, and that is a percentage for students confirmed registered, another 100 points for confirmed voting, and then we'll talk about the how of this in the next section with our panel, but um, we're going to encourage you to um, take our congressional advocacy ask. Many of you people would have already earned hundreds of points already for all your advocacy this year. It's been um, a really busy advocacy year, and thank you. But um, for, just for sending that at the, at the program director or the state director level, uh, we're giving you the congressional staff emails, right? So we don't want a thousand emails going into their inboxes, but we would want kind of one trio leader uh, to send one to each. You get five points for each of those important emails. In addition, tweets. So everyone else, big old tweet storm. And um, the more the merrier. And then if you get, if you are able to schedule a virtual meeting um, before the election, then that's five points per meeting. And same story with organizing a candidate forum or town hall. All right, so that, that is it. But as you can see, the way this thing is weighted, the way to win, if you really wanna win this thing, go up here with the voting. Okay, that is, that is how you get the most points in this little game. All right, again, it's just a game, right? Like there's no, there's no trophy. But, um, but the point is, you know, to get our students engaged, to, to have a little friendly competition, have a little fun with it. All right, so looking forward to seeing you on the leaderboard. All right, let's do this. Um, and let's get to all of the questions for the voting section before we move on. So a lot of excellent questions. Okay, so Ben Shapiro, hi Ben. Um, you asked, what if we do not have voter registration? Um, that might be North Dakota only. Clarissa or Gabrielle, would you like to answer that? Yeah. 
I'm happy to jump in here really quick. Yes, North Dakota is the only state that does not have voter registration, though uh, they do have pretty unique and sometimes complicated voter ID laws. So still you might not be able to get uh, points uh, for voter registration. You automatically get those points as folks don't have to be registered there, uh, but still incredibly important to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations there because it is still a bit complicated to actually follow through and get your vote cast. Excellent. Okay, other questions on voting and the, and the work that uh, folks have talked about here. I have a serious question that I wanted to ask. This is something I thought of before. Um, Clarissa and Gabrielle, so is there such a thing as youth voter apathy? Is that a real thing? Gabrielle, do you want to take that one? I'm happy to jump in. But... Um, I wouldn't say it's a thing, but I do feel like that it is a shared feeling and that it's a valid feeling and that instead of it being kind of just like, that's wrong or it's just not a right way of thinking, I think that we have to understand why students feel that way and work to make them understand that even with like the democracy not looking how we want it to look, we still have to vote and do what we have to do in order to get what we want to get. But I do feel like this, the feelings of students not like being the most enthusiastic about voting or feeling like this democracy doesn't look like a democracy they want to function in or participate in is a valid feeling. And um, instead of us just like sitting there saying like, that's wrong, our um, ancestors wouldn't like that. But I think we have to listen to them and just figure out a way to where they feel comfortable voting in this environment despite what's going on in the country. I would just add to that too. Um, what we found in our work through the SLSB Coalition is that it's not really apathy, but just as I mentioned with students particularly being new voters, a lot of times they're just not familiar with the systems and processes. So once, um, whether it's uh, your college or university or someone else in your community um, that invites you into the process, um, then students are much less uh, apathetic, as, as some might say, and, and much more excited to actually participate in the process. But it's just really overcoming some of those, uh, not just structural barriers, but also psychological barriers that really sometimes keep uh, particularly new voters from actually following through. It's hard, right? Young people, um, you know, move a lot, right? First gen, low income students move a lot. There are barriers in place, right? In some states, it's possible to register to vote with uh, gun registration, but not a student ID card, right? So, you know, so who put those barriers in place? And there are many, you know, systematic, systematic barriers that make it harder for students and young people to vote. And you know, with the right engagement, with those individual conversations, these things can be overcome. And if I mean. Honestly, in the last election, students jumped, young people, I think it was people 18 to 29, increased the percentage of voter turnout like by 70% from the previous midterm election. It was just like it skyrocketed through the, through the roof in terms of, and it's clearly probably know the exact number. It's like 70 something percent increase, something like that, right? So I, I know the number of college students. So College okay. student vote up, voter turnout from the 2014 midterm election to the 2018 midterm election went from 19% to 40%. So it more than, more than doubled. doubled. More, more than doubled, yeah. Right, so and maybe, you know, we can smash records again. So with your, with your hard work, with your talking to individual students, um, we can do this. So um, any other questions on this section about any of the information uh, shared so far? All right, then stay tuned. We'll be sending out a resource guide, links, reporting tools, contests, all that stuff. Um, and in the meantime, let's hear from our next panel. So uh, here we go.
Uh, we're going to have James Prince Jr., who I already introduced, president of the South Carolina Trio Association. James, take it away. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you to uh, the COE staff for inviting me to speak on this uh, panel. Um, I do want to say, I'll start off, just continue the conversation that we just had. For one of the things that we, we did our town hall specifically for our state association. However, some of the things that we'll discuss during my presentation is not only for state associations, but it is an opportunity for institutions, colleges, or wherever your TRIO program is stationed to sponsor these same type of activities at your institutions for your particular programs. Um, it doesn't have to be just limited to the state associations. And I say that because in that discussion, when we talk about the youth voter apathy, <clears throat> one of the things that we talked about in, while we were planning this event is how do we ensure that we provide our students with the resources and tools that they need to make informed decisions about the voting process as well as the candidates that they choose to elect, correct? And so throughout our states, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build um, a state of students and alumni who are going to be dedicated to not only our mission as TRIO, but who are dedicated to ensuring that they vote people in, in, in uh, office who pay attention to the policies that actually affect our communities, right? Or, or your students' communities. So many times we have this conversation about how our individual, uh, you know, our, our citizens in our particular states sometimes vote against their own issues or they vote against the issues <laughs> that really are going to assist them. Um, so they choose and they vote for politicians simply because they feel like, you know, it's family tradition or oh, my family is Democrat, so I'm just going to vote Democrat or uh, my family is Republican, so I'm just going to vote Republican when the candidate at that particular time in that voting, uh, in that voting era may not actually represent the issues that address what your family needs or what you need in your community, right? And so because of that, uh, myself as well as my board and some of our past presidents uh, put our heads together and said, what can we do to ensure that we make our students and our staff aware of the voter process, the election process, how to choose candidates that are going to support their particular issues and policies that, that will be most beneficial to them. Um, and it also allows us to build an alumni um, who we can contact, you know, and, and say, hey, we need you on these issues. Every year we do policy seminar, um, and that is very important um, and it's sponsored by COE, of course, and it's very important, but it is also important for you to engage your political uh, persons, whether they be federal, state, local, et cetera, throughout the year. Um, and so this event not only allowed us the opportunity to engage with our political representatives, whether they be federal, state, et cetera, um, but it also gave them an opportunity to speak with our students and engage with our students. And it also gave them the opportunity to see the things that we're doing here in the state, not only on TRIO's behalf, but on behalf of them as political representatives, right? And so on the first slide, what you're seeing is just an agenda of how we organize the day. Um, it allowed us to kind of make sure that we had a, a, a form, a, a plan form, so that not only our students felt like it was beneficial to them, but it was organized. And so that the representatives felt like they were providing their time for something that was gonna be effective as well. Um, and so one of the great things that we were fortunate to have is a young man by the name of Matthew, Matthew Nuccio, um, who is an educator in uh, the South Carolina Charleston School District who works with College of Charleston that were bound. Um, he is a former political speech writer. Um, and so we asked him to officiate or to moderate, I should say, uh, our political forum. It allowed him the opportunity to create some questions because he was aware of the political process and he knew what issues were important. And so he devised questions that allowed not only, and he's also an educator who does K through 12. So he knows what's important to the students and he knew what was important to, for, the, for our po uh, political representatives and was able to create questions that kind of was relatable to both so that we could stem a conversation where both parties felt like they were involved in the conversation. Um, so that was very, very uh, advantageous for us. We also invited uh, COE to participate. So uh, uh, Executive Vice President Kimberly Jones um, who also has some roots here in South Carolina. We actually call her cousin Kim here in the state. Um, she has some roots here. And so we felt it important to get in contact with her and say, hey, 
how do you advise us to implement this in our state? What advice can you give us? Um, and so she was able to give us some very solid advice, gave some suggestions about even our own local representatives who we could invite. She was a major resource for us. And so thank you to uh, Executive Vice President uh, Jones for uh, you know, giving us that information to get us uh, started on this, on this venture. I was intentional in ensuring after my conversation with uh, Kim, I was intentional in ensuring that we had like a layer or tier of various political representatives who came to our forum. And so we had a state representative who has been in politics for over 15, 20 years, uh, who has a family with kids. We had a, um, one of our representatives who's been in politics for about five years, seven years. Um, he is a lawyer here in the state. So he was that mid-tier. He's, he's had some experience. He's, he's not new in, but he's not uh, you know, one of the, uh, I guess you would say, elders in the political arena either. And then we had a young man who was one of our representatives who just came into politics. He's been voted in within the same year, very young, just turned 30 years old. So it allowed a spectrum for us in our forum so that each political representative could speak to the issues, whether it be staff and or students. Um, and so they were able to address issues and questions that the staff had. They were able to address questions uh, that the students had. Uh, as well as any type of new staff, like you know, our 25, 24 year olds who are just coming into uh, support positions and then they had their questions about the political process. And so all those representatives were able to speak to that. And then we also invited our federal senators uh, to the table. Unfortunately, uh, Senator Graham's office was not able to, um, to send a representative, but we did have a representative from Senator um, Scott's office. Her name is Laura Irvin who joined us and was able to provide some uh, great information about the political process, but she, he's also, she also serves as his educational aide, so she was able to speak about policies regarding education, um, how, you know, what we need to be looking for as it relates to TRIO, as well as how it relates to education, as some, some of our students are already in college and then some are looking toward going to college. Um, inside that conversation, we also discussed uh, things like voter registration, things that we're discussing now. So how do you get registered? Uh, why is it important to be registered? And we also brought up, you know, 2020 has presented us with a lot of challenges on the national front. I mean, we have seen things happen from social injustices, racial injustices. And so with a lot, with a large number of our students here in the state being minority students, we also want to address how they look at political uh, candidates and what they, you know, what they discuss as far as policy regarding race, gender, economics, et cetera, et cetera. And so those representatives were really able to have a very strong conversation with our students. Um, and the great thing about it is a lot of times people will see this and say, well, our students are not going to be engaged if we do something like this. They're not going to be interested. And man, on that day, we had, uh, we had more students asking questions than we did adults. We even had students who wanted to speak to the political representatives after the forum was over. So our representatives stayed on for about 15, 20 minutes after the official event to answer questions and engage with students. And some of those students were even inspired by the conversation and asked, hey, how do I get involved in politics? How do I start? Should I start with city council? Should I start with, you know, uh, just some type of local position? Um, and so they were able to kind of talk about what positions are available at your local level, at your state level, at your federal level. Um, and it was very advantageous for our students. And so we are so, so uh, glad that they were able to, to participate um, and another thing is, as Jonathan has kind of talked about the competition that's coming up, organizing something of this, of this uh, facet in your particular states, whether it be through your state association, whether it be through your institutions, et cetera, will allow you to begin the conversation that needs to be had so that you can get the students registered. If they don't understand the importance of voting, they'll never come, they'll, you, you'll never get them to, to the voter registration booth. You get what I'm saying? So having these type of introductory conversations allows them to understand the importance of why they need to be involved politically. Um, and so this, this also served in that same capacity for us here in South Carolina. And Jonathan, you can go to the next slide. I don't wanna. Now this right here, I won't go through it individually, but these are some of the planning steps that we took here in the state just to you know, kind of put our town hall together. Uh, so we proposed an idea between the past presidents, myself and, I, and the vice president who was and in our state, the vice president is responsible for all of our state uh, professional development events. And so we had a conversation 
And then what we did was we have what we call virtual coffee and conversations and I say each month since COVID has began. So at like the second week of each month, we kind of gauge our members in conversation and we asked them, hey, if we sponsor this event, what will be the participation level? And so they were very excited about it. We got some good positive feedback. And so that's a little project that we needed to have it. It was something that was needed. Um, and then throughout weeks three and four, four we just did some, we contacted, uh, like I said, we were intentional about who invited. We considered age, political experience, uh, made sure that we had Democratic and re uh, Republican representatives um, so that they could have a mesh of conversation. Um, and then we sent out invites, which is going to be in your packet, correct, Jonathan? I think the letter that we submitted to each representative is in that packet. So you have a sample of what you can send to your political representatives, whoever you're choosing to be a part of your platform. Um, and then we just organized with our communications team here in the state. Uh, we also have chairs for each of our individual programs. So here in South Carolina Trio, we have a SSS chair, Upper Bound chair, et cetera, who works with the different programs in our state. We sent it to them and, and asked them in their roundtables. We've been having roundtables each month with each one of our programs. Hey, talk about this with your, with your people and see if they'll be able to attend. And then week five, we executed the event. Uh, we got organized and we actually had two of our representatives to kind of commit last minute. They, took, they said they could not come. So we ended up having two more representatives than we expected and um, all went well from there. So um, I'll end on this note. Um, by all means, make sure that you take a look at the letter, the sample letter that we provided in the packet as well as what you have here. Uh, but I will say that be very intentional about the way that you're organizing this. For TRIO programs, we are here not only to provide our students the opportunity for uh, post-secondary education, but we are here to make them well-rounded students who understand not only what it is to go to college, but what that college education is going to do for you and your community after they graduate. And so sponsoring these type of events where they understand policy, political, um, polit the importance of political participation, et cetera, assists you with making that well-rounded student. And so this is not just to get them vote, you know, in, you know, register to vote for this for 2020, but it's to expand their minds so that throughout their lifetime as citizens of our countries, they understand, of our country, they know the importance of being politically involved, not just at this level, but when they turn 50, 60 years old and to inspire others to do the same. And so these events will allow you guys to do that in your particular states, at your institutions, et cetera. And so Jonathan, I think that takes the cake. I think I'm done unless uh, you want questions at the end and we'll go from there. Great. Thank you, James. Fantastic. Really appreciate it. So we'll, we'll hear questions on uh, your piece and the uh, Cornell piece after um, Cornell is done. So without Thank further you. ado, uh, Cornell, take it away. Uh, Kristen, yeah. Simon, and Ariane. We've got everything. And let me just say one thing. So we around the country um, have had a lot of folks do virtual advocacy um, this year. It's been a whole new shift. But this Cornell example was like a textbook example because not only was it uh, the TRIO program staff, and they got the students involved. They got a really organized way of reaching out to all of the students, representatives and senators, and they coordinated with their Office of Federal Relations. So they're all singing from the same sheet of music, all on the same page to organize an incredible advocacy day. So take it away, Kristen. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you to COE for putting on this very informative panel. I know I learned a lot and um, I am reminding myself, have I even, filled out my mail-in ballot request yet. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to talk really briefly about how our advocacy day came about and a little bit more of the background on it and then um, really pass it on to Simon and um, Ariane so that they can share their experiences with this and really um, their thoughts as well. So um, this slide really just shows we have our own school newspaper. It's called the Cornell Chronicle. Um, and one of the great things, um, in addition to actually doing the advocacy day, was that um, our newspaper wrote a story on it. Um, and I was able to capture this wonderful screenshot where Ariane is in it. She's actually um, meeting with uh, one of our local senators' staff members. So that was, that was wonderful. Um, Jonathan, if you want to go to the next slide, I'm going to primarily be on here and, and we'll, you can read it as we go. Um, so I just want to give you a little bit of background. First, um, we have started doing TRIO advocacy days for Cornell um, since I have been there. Um, 
maybe it's like a year after I started. So I think this was our fourth year. Um, in the past, we've done it in person. It's always been in the summer with our McNair students. Um, and sometimes we have our upward bound students join us as well. Obviously we switched to virtual this year <laughs> um, due to everything and it went quite successfully. Um, the switch to virtual meant a few things, which is really um, more students could participate. Um, and I'm gonna turn over to Simon to talk a little bit more about student participation. Thank you, Kristen. Again, uh, thank you all for having me on the panel. It's been a really informative. Um, so, right. So normally we do a one day activity during the summer where we have students bust in from Cornell, that's Ithaca, New York, into uh, Washington, D.C. And we sort of hunt down uh, representatives and senators and try to get the meetings, try to get students meetings with their representatives. Of course, this year was different and we didn't really know what to expect seeing that it was going to be virtual. But there were actually some upsides to it. And I think that uh, overall, our fears were assaged a bit by really some, some really well thought out planning. So kind of before student selection, I want to say that we usually do this over the summer, which is when we have our McNair summer research program. And that means that the students that we have are basically a captive audience. They're a, a captive student body. So we kind of, for a, for a lack of other words, we kind of own them for that summer. <laughs> They're committed to the research activities on campus. They, they really are devoted to every part of that programming. So what we do normally is we try to eliminate other activities and other events so that the students can fully participate without experiencing any opportunity costs. That is, without any other activity or event that they have to forego in, a, in order to actually uh, take part in advocacy. So I think that structuring, and as uh, our previous uh, speaker said, you know, being mindful and intentional with the planning part is incredibly important to having a successful experience and a high participation turnout. Because if the students are involved in the programming, if they're supposed to be doing what the programming asks of them and they're, great, they're getting a stipend in return, then of course we're gonna expect them to participate in Advocacy Day as well. So part of, like I say, the important part of that is that I would suggest trying to plan activities around the time when students are free of other competing activities and when they're committed to some of the TRIO programming so that you can have 100% participation rates like we did. And so after that, um, we moved on to the online remote virtual advocacy day, which really was advantageous because normally we only have resources for a one day experience, but because we could spread it out over the week, we really were able to have not only a 100% participation rate, but the actual raw number was greater as well. So we had about 30 students, nearly all of them having meetings with a staffer, a representative, or a senator. And of course, because they are part of the summer research program, the gathering information and selecting information from the students was kind of a no-brainer. If you're in our program, we're gonna expect you to participate. So that just inquired some logistics in terms of sending out emails for the students and a lot of these records we already had. So was, that was basically just providing kind of demographic information from our McNair scholars and then just bringing that over to Kristen's office, which then took it to the next step, which was identifying and connecting uh, with the congressional offices. Sure, thank you. So I'll, I'll talk very briefly about that. Um, the way that we have done this in the past, um, we always have the student who, where they are located, where they vote. Um, so in this case, Ariane's from Virginia. We try to connect them with their hometown members of Congress. Um, as Simon mentioned, we did have several meetings. We try to at least have um, one Senate meeting and one House meeting for each uh, student. Uh, when it's in person, it's quite a busy day. <laughs> um, so having the fact that you know we had more more days and, and we were able to spread out over a week was actually wonderful because we were able to get quite a few meetings as well. Um, and, and it's just, we generally meet with the education staffer more often than not, the meetings are anywhere from like 10 to 15 minutes. Sometimes we have those who ask a lot of questions and they go up to 30 minutes, but your typical normal Hill meeting, it just was the same thing as being virtual. 
And then we, we meaning, I'm sorry, my office, the Office of Federal Relations, one of the biggest things that we want to do um, for our students on this is we want to make sure that they are prepared and comfortable with talking to uh, members of Congress and their staff about why TRIO and specifically the McNair program is important to them. Um, so we always do at least one uh, in-person training. Normally it's via Zoom anyway, so that was very uh, normal procedure. But this year we actually added more. Um, one, to make sure that the students had time to kind of review some of the information. We provided them with background materials on TRIO, talking points as to what, you know, we recommended they, they could mention during the call. Um, and really just to make sure that they were comfortable that the call flowed smoothly. I will say that one of the things we always stress is our students, not only are they eloquent, but they, they know why the program is important to them and, and no one can argue with it. So they, we just have them prep their stories, um, which was really great and, and, and I think maybe eases their uh, comfort or you know, makes them a little bit more comfortable, I should say, in general. Um, on Advocacy Day, which was Advocacy Days this year, <laughs> we actually, uh, we, my office sent out several reminders to make sure, you know, that, that all the students knew, one, it was East Coast time, not West Coast time. Um, gave them the information for the Zoom calls. Um, if it was a Zoom call, if they had a regular call, gave them that information as well. Um, for the actual meetings, myself or my colleague in the Office of Federa Federal Relations, we're on each um, call or Zoom. And the reason for this is one, we wanted to make sure that it really just flowed smoothly. We were unsure how this advocacy day would work in a virtual setting. And um, we just wanted to make sure the conversation kept going. And when you were in a group setting, you know, we wanted to know, we wanted to help which student um, know which, when they should talk and when, when the other students should talk and things of that sort. So we were really just there as moderators. Um, I think it was a very wonderful uh, conversation and uh, everything seemed to flow smoothly on my part. And I'm going to let Ariane talk about uh, her experience as well. And then, um, and Simon, if you have anything else that I may have missed, please feel free to chime in. No, I think Ar Ariane could be able uh, to talk about sort of the things that we said, you know, think about what McNair does for you. And this would go for any other trio program, you know, the research, the, the community, the professionalization, the ability to connect with the mentor and so on. So uh, Ariane, if uh, you'd like to kind of give us an insight into kind of what the meeting was like and kind of what you said and, and help us understand what it means to you. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you so much, Jonathan. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, kind of just echoing what Kristen and Simon said, um, the planning that went into this was beautiful. Um, it was very stress-free stress on my end um, as a student and also doing research over the summer. Uh, Kristen and Anna also sent out emails uh, about like, you know, sample um, essay of like what we could say inside of the meeting and also them being there inside of the meeting as a moderator was also very helpful. Um, just keeping the conversation flowing as Kristen mentioned. Um, and uh, I got to speak with the staff members for um, Senator uh, um, Warner and Tim Kane, And both of the staffers um, pretty much knew about the TRIO program and McNair program. So that conversation was very easy. Um, so it kind of really was just me explaining why McNair was so useful to me. And that's really just the simple fact that, like Simon said, um, I'm able to connect with people who are trying to also find themselves and we're working together. Um, even though we're on different paths, we're still in the same cohort and that's like a family and very like bonding um, like experience, which is great. Um, just also with professionalism, you know, having someone to check over your resumes and things like that. And also like for me personally, like the financial stressors that um, come from personal um, life. Um, McNair definitely comes in um, very handy. So just um, echoing that inside of the conversation was very important for me just because the summer, particularly after COVID, like I didn't know whether I was going to go back home or stay, but I knew I wanted to continue my research to continue what I was doing. Um, and so, you know, sending an email over to Simon and Kristen, um, Dr. Kristen Dade, who's in the um, WADI office, the Office of Academic Diversity Initiatives um, at Cornell, 
it really it really like uh, eased a lot of my stress. Um, so just echoing that inside of the meeting was very important to me because we're talking about funding here. And so then, you know, going into what we're asking for, like we're ha we have three specific acts that we're asking of you guys, you know, just with funding, just, you know, think about funding and also think about COVID with funding. So the experience was really great and very easy. This was my first time doing it, um, but I did have other friends who had done it before. But Kristen, Simon, and Anna made it so easy that I just went in there and decided to really just explain why McNair was important to me, and that was easy. I think Fantastic. that's all. Yeah, this is an incredibly well-organized event, and we do have a similar thing with National uh, Student Leadership Congress, and it was incredible to see. I mean, Cornell did basically their own NSLC on your own. It was it was incredible. So, you know, it was amazing. And Ariane, um, this, your, your story was featured just so excellently in the Cornell um, Chronicle piece. Uh, we saw this in our news clips and it was just like, this is incredible. So huge, huge hats off to all of you working in coordination. Um, and we'll, we'll send this around so that other folks can try to follow in your footsteps. Um, so excellent work. So I'm gonna um, just, very briefly, because the event was supposed to end at 4.15, it's 4.17, so I'm just going to speed through this. You'll get this in your email with the details, but we're going to have a resource guide. Um, long story short, you can invite current elected officials, especially at the federal level, to any of your events and talk to them. They, it's their job to go to your program. They vote on your funding. So it is their job. They, they, that is part of the job description, is to meet with your students and you and see what this money does and, and see the lives that it changes. If you're inviting candidates who are not yet in office, okay, then you have to be sure to be nonpartisan. You have to invite all the candidates, give everyone equal opportunity to participate, equal time. If it's a single event or if you're doing separate events, separate meetings, separate um, virtual visits to your program, then make sure that each event with a candidate not yet in office is the same amount of time and format with no endorsement. You're not telling students who to vote for, who to vote against, but give um, folks an opportunity to share their, their opinions. Um, and then, you know, do this in advance, right? They didn't just kind of hope for the best and, and see if they would come tomorrow. They did this way in advance, they planned it out. And there's time to do, um, to, to do an event like this before the election. There's eight weeks left, so this can be done. And if not, do this year round, you know, um, like James was saying, do this year round, right? Not just for a big policy seminar or NSLC, do this year round. Um, do a sample agenda. And honestly, you know, with COVID-19, a lot of it's gonna be virtual these days. All right, um, we will, I'm not gonna read this out loud. Basically, here's a sample letter. Um, I'm also gonna, in the packet, you'll be seeing James's letter uh, exactly the way he sent it for inviting to an event. Um, okay, we did a similar kind of a forum where we had both sides talking. We had um, uh, Biden and Trump's uh, education policy surrogates talking to the TRIO community back in April. We um, coordinated, uh, Mayop took the lead, our Mideast, uh, states region took the lead at um, inviting and organizing the agenda and then we we worked together to make this available to the whole country um, so it was similar playbook we planned in advance did the agenda did the invites um, and then here are some really great spotlights of virtual meetings that have happened throughout this year in the time of COVID on the left you see Congresswoman Susie Lee of Nevada she actually tweeted a screenshot of her conversation with Nevada trio um, and on the right, you've got Senator Tammy Baldwin Staffer, um, the guy Brian at the bottom, and uh, his meeting with the Wisconsin team. Okay, so questions and answers. Um, let's do this. Sorry we went a little over time, but I'm sure there's some great questions, and we'd love to hear your, um, your questions for the panel. I want to ask one while folks are thinking. Simon, can you can you talk to me a little about um, what Cornell or what Cornell Trio does regarding student voter registration and get out the vote? Whether it's something that you yourself are working on or others that you partner with um, at Cornell. Sure. Uh, so you know uh, the I, McNair is uh, and, and the Trio programs are under an office called the Office of Academic Diversity Initiatives, and uh, we know that our students and our staff 
are really engaged uh, citizens and they're looking forward to elections and they're really involved in politics and the issues. So as an office, as you know, you know we are nonpartisan, uh, but we're there to support the students. So we started to think of ideas of how to actually bring students into the process and to ease it as a uh, our first speaker, I think Clarissa said, you know, a lot of the times uh, students really don't, they have so much on their plate, everything is new, they don't know where to start. So we said, well, we'll start with education first. Before we get to actual registration and that sort of stuff, what we want to do is to try to figure out what issues are important to them. Once we figure out the issues, then we'll want to ask the students whether they'd like to partake, whether they'd like to cast their vote here in Ithaca and make an impact here or back in their home community because they have the option to do that. So I think that was a very first important step. Once we do that, uh, then we just go through kind of the, a very similar process uh, that Clarissa spoke about and our first speaker spoke about, which was getting them to the proper websites, getting them to register, getting them to commit and following up during our advisement meetings uh as to whether or not they've done that but now that we have your template and we have this competition going jonathan i think that uh <laughs> we're going to have to up our game a little bit here since to, to get some transparency and to get some kudos coming our way if we deserve them so kind of a little bit about kind of what we did we didn't really we weren't prompted by the university to do this they i know that there are other departments on campus that do this but we just thought we'd like to do this for our students and show our commitment since they uh, have shown theirs to us. So we reciprocated by trying to, trying to organize, bring some organization to this. Great, and we have, uh, we have a question from uh, Kimberly Jones. Hey there, this is actually a question for the folks who are participating, our trio folks, and maybe you could answer via the, via the Q&A, simple yes or no, or maybe using the raise hand function. But I'm wondering, for a lot of you, do you find that your students, if you're serving uh, collegiate students, or even pre-college, if you're you know, working with adults, or maybe the parents of, of some of the younger students, do you feel like there's a general apathy or uh, disinterest or in, in the voting process? Are people, um, kind of not caring or do you think people are really interested or are they discouraged what's i mean do you think people are just checked out if so raise your hand or say yes okay this is good i'm not seeing i'm not seeing a lot of raised hands so either you've already logged off okay so i'm not seeing that many okay great ha that makes me feel a whole lot better i'm i'm really happy to see that All right, any other questions, um, Kim, or anyone else who um, wants to, to ask any final questions before we close out? I'm good, this has been awesome. Very enriched in, in form information. Okay, great. So then um, I guess without further ado, we will put up our contact slide and play a little closing clip. 